My name is Rebecca Bradford Divin, but I was mostly known as Becky Bradford Divin. Okay, well tell us about your background and what you were doing before the war. Um, did you want, your outline said you wanted birth dates and where. Oh, whatever you... I don't care. Okay, sure. Uh, I was born in Globe, Arizona, January 6, 1918. My parents were, my mother was a school teacher, my father was a banker. I went through school in Pasadena, we moved to California, and I went through schools in Pasadena up through junior college and then went first to Berkeley for a year and then to USC for my final year. I graduated with a BS in science, but it was really, well, I'm sorry, that's incorrect, a BS in education. With physical education as a major and life science as a minor. I never worked in teaching. Uh, I graduated in June of 1941 and immediately went to a summer job that I'd had for three years as a counselor at an expensive girls' camp at Echo Lake, which is above Tahoe Lake. And I went two weeks pre-camp, four weeks of camp, and two weeks post-camp. I loved it. I was a lifeguard, a craft teacher. I could play with the kids. I, it was as near an ideal job as a person at the very end of the Depression could have had. Um, another counselor and I had agreed that in September we thought we would go to Mexico together and then be there in time for the February session of the University of Mexico. But I needed another $100 to be secure. And to put it mildly, my father spiraled through the ceiling, refused the money, and I said, that's all right, I'll get a job. Well, the job I got was unexpected. It was at California Institute of Technology in the sub-basement. Um, we were not exactly honest with each other. I didn't say that I planned to leave in uh, February, and they didn't tell me I was working on a national defense project. So December 7th came along. I went to work. A great big sign on the door, National Defense Project. No entrance without permission. I was locked in. I couldn't change. You couldn't leave work without permission, written permission, to prevent proselyting during the war. So it wasn't the time to go to Mexico anyway, and I stayed. This job involved quartz fiber were microfibers, and it was in the sub-basement of the chemistry building working on Linus Pauling invention of a oxygen meter for submarines. I was trained on the job. I didn't, had never worked with microfibers, and by uh, 
close to October of 43, the oxygen meter had gone into manufacturing to make it on scale for the submarines. And I was bored, silly. That wasn't what I wanted. So I told my bosses at Caltech that I was going to quit and told you can't quit. You are locked in. And I said, but I can quit. I have saved my money. I can live at home for the three months I have to be without employment. And then I'm going to join the Navy, the Army, or Red Cross, whoever will take me. And I said, well, let us think about that. And in a little while, I was called in and said, we have a job. <laughs> we can't tell you what it is, where it is, but they want you to come and do quartz fiber work. Well, that sounded kind of strange and they said, well, after you agree to take the job, we'll tell you where it is and what you will be doing. And I said, well, can you tell me, is it for the war effort? Yes, but we can't tell you what it is. Well, why? Well, it's secret. I will only tell you that I don't approve of it. Why? For moral reasons. But it is for the war effort, yes. Well, I thought about that for a while and said, okay, I'll take it. Well, what they told me was that only that it would be an army base it would be in the mountains, there would be pine trees. Um, once I agreed, I had to stay there for the duration of the war. And I'm sorry, I really don't remember what the salary was, but for a non-technical person, I thought it was very handsome, uh, so I agreed to take it. In due time, I received information more about not what I would, I would be doing quartz fiber work. To this day, I do not know how they knew I did quartz fiber work at Caltech. Then I was told, first you will go to Berkeley and you will report to the top floor of the chemistry building. And I got up there and was told, oh, you're going to make a micro balance with quartz fibers and you're going to design the jigs and things to make it. I looked at them absolutely appalled. I never designed anything in my life, and I had not made a balance. And they said, oh, we're sure you'll figure it out. We'll give you all of the help, and we'll expedite things through the machine shop. I despaired for the war effort if it depended on people like me. But amazingly enough, we did it. I had to learn some math. I had to learn some drafting. And they did help me. After I'd been there two months, I wrote the project and said, I quit. I've been here two months. I've never been paid, I'm hungry, I don't have a place to stay anymore, and I'm going home. Well, before I left, this 
had to take a few days to get the letter. But before I left work one day, there was a man up there with money in his hand. Your paycheck was in Los Alamos, wondering why you weren't picking it up. <laughs> so I now had money, but no place really to stay because of everything was full. It was a housing shortage. So I spent the next month sleeping in beds of project workers who were away on business or intent. I left lived out of a suitcase. Then everything was through the machine shops and shipped, and I went home to Pasadena for um, maybe a week, and then I couldn't get transportation. And, a, and I told them that I'm ready, but I can't get there. And the train master in Pasadena called and said, you have a reservation on the train on a given date, and um, just come. It's apparently been paid for. I later discovered that I had bumped a major and a count captain from this little roomette that I was traveling in luxury to Los Alamos, and I was to be met, and so I dressed with care. A little pillbox with a veil, my precious nylons, high heels, and I was ready to go to Los Alamos. Well, I stood on the platform, waited and waited, and finally, a whack came up and said, are you Becky Divin? Yeah. Ah. And I later discovered they said, she's never going to last here. <laughs> well, I got to Los Alamos and discovered I was making a microbalance to weigh plutonium. They only had micro amounts. Now I should back up and tell you this is January of 1944. Uh, and they only had micro amounts. And in due time, I made a microbalance. However, nobody had calculated static electricity. And every time we were ready to weigh something, it slapped up against the wall and broke because of static electricity. So the balances delayed and delayed, and in due time, we made a weighing of the total supply of plutonium on a microbalance. Well, by a total of three months, I was out of a job because quantities were arriving from Oak Ridge in, a qu in an amount to use commercial balances. So they then said, you aren't doing the job you were trained for, but we would like you to stay, and we will train you to do the work that you will be doing if you will stay. We would like a one-month trial for us to decide you can do the work and you to decide if you want to do it. So I was in um, a group in CMR in the chemistry building um, to add, well, how did they, they, plutonium was scarce, so they tried to recover it, and they would send me very small samples, and I, with a pipette, I would put these samples on a platinum disc 
dry it very, very carefully. Then it would go into a Geiger counter to be counted, and those numbers would then tell the chemist how much plutonium was in that solution and had, for the reasons I don't know, they didn't tell me. I didn't know what I was working on, but uh, I was in the lab by myself. Pretty soon I had a person working for me, then another person working for me. Eventually they made me a section head with a group of women. Mostly these people were wives that I then trained to do what I had been trained to do. Um, what else do you want? Well, that's fascinating. So did you continue in this job throughout the war until the end, or did you have that same job for the rest of the war? Uh, no. Uh, well, yes, I did. Uh, for work hours, as you had asked Ben, uh, I would do these jobs. Now, I never really knew where these solutions came from. It might not have been always recovering, but it could be most anything. And before the Trinity test, I was working 18 hours a day, uh, one day, I remember all of us were, I had maybe five girls, five women, and six of us were in my little dorm room waiting until the solutions were ready to be analyzed. And um, somebody from lab would come over and get us because we may as well be listening to books or uh, tapes or we didn't have tapes, records, or something. And then when we were called, we would go back to the lab, and a car would come and pick all of us up and take us back to the lab. Um, we worked six days a week. I loved it. Anything else? So you lived in the women's <coughs> dormitory. Correct. There were six in your dorm, in the small dorm? It was a small dorm. There was a quadrangle of, at that time, four dorms. That was going to be more than they needed. Two women and two men. And we made a quadrangle, and at one end off was the mess hall. My dorm room, there were 20 people, is that right, maybe to the dorm, and there were two rooms to one bath, and we didn't have bath, uh, roommates, we had bathmates, and um, ten upstairs, ten downstairs, and the same for the men, so uh, two women and two men, uh, and I ate all my meals at the mess hall. My room was 9 by 12, and it had an army cot, a small oak desk and chair, and a closet with no door, and no curtains on the windows, and none on the door. Um, Maid service, all of the linens were furnished, and um, I bought material and handmade curtains and a curtain for the closet. There were no hangers, and I wrote home and said, Can you send me some hangers? My bathmate has loaned me four. She has doubled up her clothes. <coughs> and um, there was a comrade, camaraderie that developed 
and these people became lifelong friends. Um, I went the first Christmas, I got some money, and I bought a little two gray hills rug to put on the floor. And I kept pleading with my mother, can you find a lamp to hang on the wall? Then I, um, she couldn't. Uh, but the bath was a standard sink toilet with no lid and a shower. And nobody in their right mind would take a shower without at least a quart of water, water in case the water went off. And, you, and I only soaked what a quart of water would wash. And um, I then wanted a hot plate, and, but where to plug it in? So the wood shop gave me a board that would fit on top of the toilet. And we very quickly got used to cooking on the toilet. Sounds strange, but we did it. And I still use the pressure cooker that I bought at that time because it took 12 hours or more to cook a pot of beans due to the altitude. Oh, oh, all right. I was in a group, I mean, my job was called radio assay, and I was in the chemistry building, and I worked first with the balance when Joe Kennedy and Art Wall were the people who hired me, and I worked with Art Wall, uh, making the balance and weighing the plutonium. After that was through, they trained me in radioassay, and I was in Charlie Metz's group, and Herman Ashley was the alternate. And they were the ones I reported to who trained me, who took care of me. <laughs> and you were telling me that you were one of the very few women who were brought to Los Alamos as a scientist. I, excuse me, I wasn't bought in as a scientist. And uh, on, there just, were... Hang on just a second. Let's try that question again after the... Uh, Go ahead. I was a technician who was trained on the job. There were PhD women. There was one in the dorm that I lived in, uh, but there were not women technicians early on until the wax came, and then there were wax in the building. Um, as well as SCDs, who were special engineer detachments. And um, they, um, so I sort of was alone in one end of the chemistry building. But that didn't make much difference. I put on booties and protective clothes and latex gloves and in the lab. And the door was closed. I had worked w with the hoods, and I had good training for safety and what to do and to explain what I needed. If it was technical, they had to come and tell me what it was and how to do it. Uh, what about the wives of the scientists? Did they... Any training? Or Many wives. They, they didn't have housing. They had to build more dorms very soon. So <coughs> they tried very hard to use wives as much as possible. So I had three women who were wives no children who wanted to work, and I trained them on the job, just like I had been trained. Now, did they enjoy it as much as you did? I don't know that. Most of them were anxious to leave as soon as the war was over. Um, I was kind of unique 
and uh, in that <coughs> I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think I need to take a drink. Oh, yes, please. My vocal cords sometimes just don't. I don't know where it was. <laughs> oh, what? Before you start again. Slightly amusing thing connected with equipment for the dorm, if you're ever convenient to go back to that. Oh, sure. Sure, go ahead. Oh, as far as the equipment, what I was telling you, we had army blankets, army sheets, army towels, army washcloths, and it was a little startling when you picked up the washcloth and towel and things. It's everyone said used, U S E D, United States Engineer Detachment. <laughs> And we all had great jokes about our used linens. The dorm cost $15 a month, including maid service, um, laundry, and they cleaned the rooms. And the mess hall, I don't know if I remember what it cost. Uh, it must have been maybe $25, I think, a month for three meals a day. Um, and I just had forgotten to include that in the dormitory. Uh, I believe you asked how I met Ben. He was one of those figures that went in and out of the men's dorm. He frequently visited... Elda Anderson, who had a Ph.D. in physics and worked in the area where he did, so I would see him come up to visit her. I never really knew Ben during the war. He just was there. Then he left and went to college, I mean graduate school, and then came back in 1950, and that's when... I really met him. So it wasn't a bolt of lightning from the sky or any such exciting thing. Were there many um, couples in Los Alamos made during the war? I mean, you hear... Oh, yes. There were lots. And you need to understand that single women were scarce because you had MPs, engineers, single scientists. Um, so there were many more eligible men than there were eligible women. And so there was a steady stream of people getting married and then needing apartments rather than dorm rooms. And there really wasn't very much a in place to get married. So many of those early marriages were in Dorothy McKibben's garden. And much later, in 1951, when Ben and I married, we also were invited to use Dorothy's garden for old times' sake if we wanted, and we did. Tell me a little bit about Dorothy McKibben and who she was. Just Beg pardon. Yeah, just just can can you tell us about Dorothy McKibben and who she was? Dorothy McKibben. Yeah. yeah, Dorothy McKibben was the person, the lady in charge of 109 East Palace. That's where everybody went when they arrived to Dorothy McKibben, a very warm, generous, smiling woman who immediately put you at ease and said, I'm so glad to meet you, and I hope you love it, and if you need anything, anything at all, let me know. And she also became a lifelong friend of everybody who ever went through her office. That's wonderful. Um, what, 
about uh, the balance. You, you might have seen women who were wives that were encouraged to participate in work, but they also had children. How did people manage that? Oh, that, that was a source. No, part of this is, was a source subject, and I'll explain that. The wives, they had a maid service. The army furnished transportation to go through the villages and the pueblos to pick up day workers, labor, janitors, um, Indian women to come up for maid service for apartments. And there was an office maintained, I think it was just called the maid service, and the maids would report to this office, and anybody who really wanted a maid or needed help would go to the service and say they needed it. Well, wives who had technical training or wives whose husbands were important and things needed help at home had children, so the maids would go and help them. I, in the dormitory, had no access to the access to that service because I was female. I could do my own working earning. I didn't need help, and so I couldn't get a maid. And I thought this was really unjust, and I was complaining one day to Juan Pino, who lived in Tosito, Suzuki, who was the janitor, then I sure did need somebody to do my ironing, and they wouldn't let me have a maid. And he said, I will bring my wife to you. And I said, he said, she go, goes to the maid service. And I said, but if she comes, she'll lose her job. No, she won't. I will bring her to you when I come up. Then she will go to the maid service and say, I missed the bus this morning. <laughs> and so that then they would send her someplace. But maid service was a lifesaver to working wives. Okay. And to me. <laughs> In addition to having the maids and, and day laborers from the Pueblos and, and the Hispanic communities, what other um, interactions did, were there between those communities and Los Alamos? Oh, I think there was a lot of interaction because the maids became members of scientists' family, and they could keep the same one if they wanted every day. I mean, this was something worked out by them. And whenever there was a dance, Juan would tell me, you are invited, you may come to my house in the Pueblo. Um, now, transportation for me was a problem. I had no car and there was no public transportation. So um, that, I didn't go a lot, but I did go to some of them. And um, Later on, I was invited to home, to a home of Indians that I knew on feast day to come and have a meal with them. You mentioned you bought a two gray hill rug? Yes. And where did you get that? Oh, this was a Christmas check from my family. Uh, $20. It was, you know, this is different period a long time ago for money, and I found this two gray hill at Packard's um, Indian store on the plaza in Santa Fe, and I don't know, it, it covers a door uh, down past the um, knob and just the width of a, what a door would be is where it lives now. But it was on the floor, and I paid $20 for this two gray hill. Oh, and 
Laurencita, who was Juan Pino's wife, was a potter in Tsuki. And much later, uh, after the war, after I was married, I remained friends, and Laurencita uh, would come. And whenever she'd need some money, she'd come up and say, I have an Indian bowl and I need $30, could you buy it? So we have a supply of Indian pottery from Tsuki. Yeah. Women that, that uh, you particularly admired or knew or were things so compartmentalized that you didn't know any of the women that, I don't know, that may have been... Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Uh, I became lifelong friends with Elizabeth Graves, who was married to Alvin Graves, um, and she uh, had a Ph.D. and worked, and early on in 1943, outside of the lab, completely independent of the lab, I became fast friends with her. And um, we were lifelong friends. Uh, I don't recall women during the war in D building that um, I was friends with in the chemistry, uh, I met people, if they were single, in the dormitories. And there were women working in other places. In the mess hall, was that uh, both for men and women, or was it segregated? I'm sorry? In the, at the mess hall? Would oh, you, did you no. you with men or just with women? The mess hall was... Uh, was a, a sort of a, a fun place in a different way. It was mass, I mean, you know, large cooking. You ate off of a, a, a tray, a GI tray. You walked down and they plopped whatever you said uh, and the amount you wanted. The tables were long tables with benches. You ate, sat anywhere. One day I went in fairly early, looked around, didn't see anybody I knew, so I sat down to a Spanish-American worker. I don't know, janitor or labor or whatnot. He was appalled, and a little bit he got up and moved. <laughs> I thought he'd be interesting to talk to, but <laughs> I very quickly learned, no, uh, I was... I was different, <laughs> and so I didn't try that again. But regularly, the single people that ate at North Mass uh, intermingled. You just sat down at a table, and people came. That was the way you met people in other departments, physicists, chemists, medical, hospital, whatever. Uh, you ate at the mess hall. Later on is the... Um, project crew that was North Mess and West Mess, and uh, the GIs ate at West Mess or their own mess. So among the different groups, the SED and the WAX and the GIs and you know your group, was there much intermingling? Oh yes, oh, yes. all the time. Um, there was no segregation. Nobody cared whether I was a technician or a PhD. Yeah. Now, I I made friends easily, but uh, and I talked to the janitors and practiced Spanish, and they'd laugh laugh at me. I was invited to the valley to janitor's houses, but I couldn't really go because I didn't have transportation. But other scientists, I knew them just as well as 
as anybody. And I was invited to people's homes for dinner who were not in my group, but in other groups. And because I knew how to ski before I came, I had, was frequently invited to join a carload of skiers. Um, they could have been married or single, mostly men, because at that time there were very few women who skied. And I had no gasoline coupons to share. So my means of paying, sharing, was I could pet sit if they were going to be gone and needed somebody to sit their pets. I frequently would uh, sit a child so the parents could go to the movies of the married people who had invited me to go skiing. Um, at Christmas, Thanksgiving, any holiday, I always had more invitations to dinner than I could accept. And the dormitories, incidentally, everybody in my dorm would get together, chip in, and give a dorm party. And because it was dusty, muddy, raining, snowing, you wore boots and things to work, we always specified formals for the ladies so we could dress up for something. And um, then that was a means of inviting payback to people who had invited you to dinner. So we'd have big dorm parties. And I think, well, then the men's dorms might do that, but I know my dorm sort of every four months or so would have a dorm party. And we'd have crews set up and clean up. And uh, then we would have punch in which somehow uh, lab alcohol would magically appear and we could make punch and different things. Um, there was a commissary so we could get food and have some snacks and things at our parties. Was there dancing? And did you have dancing? Oh, yes. Of course it was to um, records or things like that. But then we wore long dresses and uh, I've got a picture or two of people dancing in their ladies in their form of, and uh, uh, it was just, by this time, you just about knew everybody on the hill by name or by face recognition. Now, people frequently ask me, did I know Oppenheimer? from a distance, but one of my letters homes, home to my mother after the war said, Oppenheimer stopped by my desk today as he was prowling the halls, and he said, you must have been skiing. Um, you look so healthy and brown. How are things going? So as Ben has already told you, he knew people, he knew where they were, he knew your name, how he could have remembered my name, I don't know, probably because I had been uh, as a dormitory representative on the early town councils, and incidentally, Ben was on the very first town council appointed by Oppenheimer. And then I was on it as a dormitory representative. And then well after the war, I was on it still um, just as a town representative. And a letter home said, 
I've got to put on shoes and dress up to go to a lady's tea and tell them about town council. If I'd known that, I'd have never agreed to run. <laughs> Wasn't my thing. <laughs> So was the town council Oppenheimer's idea? Originally, I guess. Yeah, Oppenheimer <clears throat> decided that... Uh, Oops, needed, now we're getting off the camera here. That they, they needed uh, representation from yeah, various Thomas. people. I, I can't record that. You can't record it. I uh, can repeat yeah. it. Okay, yeah. all right, okay. go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, then. So anyway, uh, he appointed... Say that for the camera? Let's see. Maybe, do you want to, you, can you say that for the camera? I can yeah. sort of, maybe he can quietly post me. Um, are you ready? Yeah. Uh, for town council in the very beginning, Oppenheimer decided that they needed some representation, and he asked people like Ben Divin, as a representative of the dorm, and Jean Bocker as a representative of Housewives. Bob Wilson was a representative of a scientist, and I don't recall who the others were, but they would have been representative of the town. And this first meeting was at his house, and that was before my time here in 44, January of 44, but not long after my arrival, I was asked if I would be a representative of the dorm on the town council. And these names, I, I don't remember who they were now. Jean Bacher was still there, I know. Um, and uh, then later on, it was a formal town election. And I no longer, <clears throat> on the last one, ran as a town representative, not dorm representative. Great. I'm hearing a bunch of noise in the background. Oh, okay. Reaction to arrival and town. Uh-huh. Okay, tell us about that. Oh, well, my I was told when I before I came here that there would be pine trees and it would be in the mountains, but they didn't say much more than that. So I got off the train in Laming, and I looked around at those scrub pinions and thought, honey. You've been head. They don't know a pine tree. But as the car came up the hill, the trees got larger and larger, and I thought I'd arrived in heaven. I lived in the ponderosa pines. I was in the mountains. I could go out of my dorm into the trees hiking more than once, somebody would bang on my door before breakfast and say, wake up, it snowed, let's go skiing. And I'd jump up and we'd ski and miss breakfast, incidentally, and then I'd get to work in time. I thought that was heaven. Imagine being able to go right out of your dorm room into place where you could ski or hike in the mountains. That sort of thing was, I think, essential to me, was hiking and skiing and being in the mountains. And there were times in which I worked seven days a week. There was none of that. We were allowed one day a month that did not count against sick leave or vacation to go shopping because you couldn't buy a thread, a spool of thread, anything on the hill. And if you made the mistake of saying, I'm going to town, you left with a long list of purchases for people on the GMI bus that went down on the 
sort of a regular schedule. I could get there by the time the stores open, and then I could get back in half a day and go hiking or whatever, and uh, do the the shopping we needed because there was nothing here in 44. Uh, I loved it. I thought it was wonderful. Mud, dust, wind, that's all right. I didn't have proper shoes for this climbing and was introduced to Sears Roebuck catalog. I didn't know such things existed. And on my first order, I remember I was giving size and what I wanted and then said, anything in my size. <laughs> because, you know, we had rationing, gasoline rationing, leather rationing, and food rationing. Leather um, was because of army shoes manufacturing. And that was another means of paying back the one family, Herb and Jean Bridge, who were so good to have me to dinner and to take me skiing. And they had about a two-year-old, I don't remember exactly now, and he outgrew his shoes so fast, and they had no shoes for themselves because of Ray. And I was easy on shoes and almost never used my quota, so I would give them my shoe coupons, and that was just heaven for them. Um, there were blue points for canned goods, and things that were imported, like pineapple, were very high in points and red points for meat, but I had to turn in my ration book to the mess hall because I was not using them, and apparently it was against regulations to have them. So when I wanted to go shopping, I would say, I need my ration book from the mess sergeant to buy shoes. And it was illegal to have a coupon without the book. Uh, so I would give my friends then the coupon for their son, and they would put it in their book. And then when I got back, I'd turn it back into the mess hall. The mess hall sergeant was very good if you were going to go on a picnic or someplace, you could go and say, I would like some meat for a barbecue uh, on a picnic. And he would give you from the mess hall what you needed uh, for the picnic. And uh, he would give you other supplies if you needed it. Or you could have your coupon book to buy some canned things if you were going camping, but that wasn't very practical because canned goods were heavy, but you would use them for whatever you needed at that point, or for the dorm parties.